the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the first Wade Center podcast of 2023. We have changed our schedule and made it very predictable so that we will always be releasing our podcast on the last Friday of every month this year. And what we say will be very predictable. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh I was not sorry, Even David. less predictable. Over. But the reason we've changed the schedule from every two weeks to once a month is, as we mentioned last time, we're providing a great opportunity that we call Wonders of the Wade, where you can see video vignettes of us showing special objects, special manuscripts that are archived at the Wade. And these will be one-minute videos on Instagram and five-minute videos on YouTube. So this will probably be ready sometime in February. We will keep you apprised. So you can check the Wade website to learn more about that in February. Today, we are discussing a C.S. Lewis book that was published in 1958. So this is after he completed all his Narnia Chronicles. And it is called Reflections on the Psalms. And I want you to know that I was gobsmacked by this book. This book I found to be one of the most devotionally profound books that I have read by wow. C.S. Lewis. Part of it was due to the fact I had never read it before, so oh, okay. I didn't know what to expect. But it is also related to the fact that I just read through the Psalms oh. this past year and was having real problems with the Psalms because people would say, oh, yes, you need to pray through the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, how do you pray through the verse that talks about smashing out babies' brains yeah. on the rocks? How do you pray through all these cursings yeah. and just this? Um, vile sentiments yeah. toward their enemies. And that is exactly the issue that C.S. Lewis is addressing yeah. in this book. Book. And before we start discussing how he addresses it, David, why don't you give us a background on why C.S. Lewis was so interested in the Psalms? Well, I was getting ready to purvey some misinformation. Uh oh. Oh. Uh, I had understood that they were revising the Psalter, the Anglican Church. Yeah. And he, along with T.S. Eliot, were invited to update the language and make it more clear. Yeah. And I thought these reflections came from his work on the Psalter. Nope. <laughs> but I just read this morning yeah. that he'd already written the book uh -huh. before he was invited Part to be before on the, the horse, committee. my friend. Yeah, there you go. I could have corrected you, you. This has been the one time in my life I could have corrected <laughs> David about C.S. Lewis. I Dang just it. found it out this morning. Uh, yeah, there's this great book called by Walter Hooper called C.S. Lewis Companion and Guide, and it will give you a quick overview of all of Lewis's books yeah. plus some reviews. I just read a review of Reflections on the Psalm. The Times Literary Supplement said, this book may not tell you all you want to know about the Psalms, and it may tell you more than you want to know about yourself. Oh, yeah, that, was that an is way to yeah. so great. And Lewis even starts. So why don't we just jump right oh, into the introduction? Before we do that, I wanted to mention one thing. Uh, in a previous issue of Seven, I think it was like volume uh, 35 or maybe okay. 36. This is the journal that the Wade publishes. Yeah, the, w the Seven, the journal of the Marini Wade Center. Uh, there's an article by Joel Heck, and he's talking about C.S. Lewis working working with T.S. Eliot on the songs. Oh, good. So if you wanted to learn more about that, how that came about, the timing of it and everything Joel gets into, yeah, as, he, as he, you know, does, he gets into all the nitty gritty details and the history of it. So um, that's the only reason I know about that is because Joel did all the hard work. But, okay. <laughs> but that's a good <laughs> but story about But you edited the, yeah, the piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what is lovely about the introduction, in my mind, is that Lewis is identifying with us the common reader, someone who hasn't been uh, trained as a biblical scholar, someone who knows scholarship about the Psalms. And 
in Lewis's typical humility, he just says, well, I'm, I'm just uh, like a schoolboy. I am not a Hebraist, not an historian or archaeologist. I just want to share with you some of the things that bothered me about the Psalms. And that's when I jumped up and said, yeah. oh, good, oh. I need to hear C.S. Lewis explain those difficult passages to me. Yeah. And he just starts us off by, by saying, this was my impression. This is how I re have resolved the emotional and psychological tensions that yeah. was created for me when I read the Psalms. Yeah, he sets up a good, uh, with this, a good analogy at the beginning of uh, a student is sometimes better able to correct a problem that a fellow student is having than if you take it to the professor. Because yes. as he says in the book, the professor has long since solved that problem and moved on to other things. And so he doesn't even really understand why that's an issue for them or, you know, may not do a good job of understanding what they don't know, you know, because mm -hmm. to you, it's so, you know, commonly understood that you don't even assume that people don't know that. So this is, I'm a student helping you as a fellow yes. student, but he's starts out, I mean, the first line is, this is not a work of scholarship. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so no, we're not going to come in here and talk about, you know, how biblical or scholars have proved him wrong on this side or the other, because right. he's not really approaching it from that yeah. way. And he admits that right up front. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I loved that he says in this introduction is he deals with the fact that the Psalms are poetry. And yeah. that has to be remembered. And he explains the type of poetry that the Hebrews used for the Psalms. And the distinctive of poetry at that time is parallelism. Whereas we who have inherited the Latin tradition of rhyme and meter, it, we can't understand how this could be poetry. And parallelism is just the fact that you'll see in many of the Psalms a statement that is repeated, but in different <laughs> words. Yeah. And what I loved about this is C.S. Lewis is explaining whether it's a wonderful piece of luck or a wise provision of God that the psalmists use poetry that could be interpreted into any language, yeah. because this is the trouble with the interpretation of Dante, let's say, uh -huh. that how do you maintain the rhyme and rhythm when you put it into other language that has different rhythms? Yeah. And so some people then will just say, oh, this translation doesn't capture Dante at all. But the Psalms can speak to someone of any culture. Yeah, that's how I feel about uh, t types of poetry that involve meter. It just... Like if it's popular at the time or if you translate it into a different language, you're like, I mean, I, 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 it just loses yeah. so much of it. As right. opposed to the Green Knight, which one of the things we enjoyed was like, well, you just throw a bunch of the same sounding consonants together yeah. and it just <laughs> right. sounds, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's lots right. Lots of R sounds in this. Alliteration works yeah. that way too. And a professor at UCLA who said, well, translations are like wives. If they're beautiful, they're not faithful. And if they're faithful, oh. they're not beautiful. Oh. Denounce I him. I remember after class, I saw three or four female students going through. And I said, yeah, I think good for I them. know what they're talking about. Yeah. But but yeah, he, my professor called these thought rhymes rather oh, than oh. Uh, verbal rhymes. They're thought yes. rhymes. Yeah. He does a good job in here. Of, I, I like this. Again, I'm not going to read a whole lot, but he says, if this is not recognized as the pattern, the reader will find either mare's nests, as some of the old preachers did, in his effort to get a different meaning out of each half of the yes. verse, oh. or else feel that it is rather silly. And I like that. The, right. You, know, you finding... have to understand the form. Yeah. And this is essential. And he starts us off right away in the introduction to the idea of incarnation. He says... Poetry, too, is a little incarnation, giving body to what had been before invisible and inaudible. I just loved that line because the power of poetry is that it speaks both through form and content. Yeah. And a lot of people who don't get poetry, it's because they aren't thinking incarnationally. Mm. The, the idea of a body that is filled with thought. And too many Christians just um, think of the Bible not incarnationally. And of course, the essence of our faith 
as Christians was established at the first ecumenical council in 325 that Jesus is both fully flesh and fully divine. And Jesus was the word of God. So also is the Bible the word of God. And the theme of this whole book is that the Bible is incarnational as well. It is fully flesh and it is fully divine. And it's so fascinating that one of the early heresies of the church was called docetism. It developed in the second century before. It's part of the reason, one of the reasons they had to bring together an ecumenical council and say, we have to determine what are heresies and what is the essential truth that God is communicating to us. And docetism basically argues that, well, Jesus looked like he was flesh, but he wasn't really flesh because, yeah. ew, you know, in fleshed people. The flesh is dirty. Yeah, it's yeah. dirty. The dose, the dose, they actually said it that way. Ew. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's been recorded in the in, church in the, uh, Yes. In the ecumenical council, get rid of the word ew. <laughs> um, so I was starting to understand when I was reading through the Psalms this past year why some docetists wanted to get rid of the Old Testament altogether yeah. because I I had inherited the fundamentalist view from my childhood mm. where you only think of content. You think of the Bible yeah. as a, a docetic document. Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting in the introduction is where he points out that Jesus would have been steeped in this kind of talking yes. and right, thinking right. that this was sort of the language of his country. He says, uh, our, our Lord soaked in the poetic tradition of his country, delighted to use it. And then he gives a yes. couple examples where uh, he re- you know repeats himself, judge and you will not be judged and things like that. The thing that I also liked about him pointing this out is he frees you up as the reader to go, oh, OK, I don't have to read the Psalms like I'm trying to dissect something with hidden meaning. Yes. Where you're you're like, well, what does he mean with this? And yes. then this is contrasting with this. And he frees you up to go like, well, what is, if I take if I read these two lines together, what's the general gist of it? And he does that throughout this where he'll take a translation from somebody like Moffat or the Book of Prayer and he just puts it in like plain English. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, like don't hate people, you know, or something like that, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, right. and you just you go, you go, oh, OK, I don't right. have to over spiritualize everything and right. over complicate everything. And it doesn't. And he, he keeps pointing out here also that it was written to Jews who were peasants. You know, they weren't this sort of sophisticated upper class. And so it's also very connected to yeah. the earth. And well, actually, simple. that is <clears throat> what he brings up in the next chapter. So maybe we yeah, should yeah. move on to chapter two. He just has an introduction and then chapter two, <laughs> which he calls judgment in the Psalms. Um, what did you think about this idea of judgment, David? Well, this is one of my, uh, the first time I read this, one of the most helpful paradigms. We as Christians are used to thinking of ourselves on we're the defendants, we're in the dock, as the British would say. And he says, for the Jews, it's not a criminal case in which we're being tried. It's a civil case in which they are the complainants or the plaintiffs. Yeah. And so when they keep calling on God to judge... A lot of times in the New Testament, people don't want to be judged. They're afraid of judging. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. They need mercy. Yeah, right. no, no, don't bring the judge in. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, to me, that was a very helpful insight yeah. to say, well, they're, they're thinking of themselves as the uh, plaintiffs or the complainants in a civil trial rather yeah. than defendants in a criminal trial. Yeah, and he gives the example in the New Testament of the the parable of the unjust judge where this right. poor old woman has had some sort of tract of land or something taken away from her and she wants the judge to show up because she knows if she could just get in front of him, the case would be resolved because it was so obvious that what was done to her was wrong. It was an injustice. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he points out that for most of human history, judges were people that had to be bribed in order to yes. step in. Right. And it was the people that could afford the bribes were the wealthy. And so the wealthy right. would just get away with just injustice right. all over the place. And well, I'm glad that doesn't happen now. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> it's a good thing that's not a problem. Well, yeah. he does point out that uh, that kind of a system doesn't just happen by accident. And <laughs> right. So, yeah. But right. um, but it, it's a different view where he, he's saying, you know, it's uh, we're crying out to God for, you know, for him to step in and intervene on our right. behalf against some injustice that's been right. done to us. And this is a, an example, and you see it in every single chapter of what I mean by the incarnational 
um, power of the Psalms in that we have to understand the situatedness of the people who are writing the Psalms. If we impose our own mindset on to Scripture, we're going to miss what is really happening. We have to understand that they were thinking of judgment in a radically different way than we, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, think of judgment. Well, I think they experienced chronic oppression in a way that we as uh, comfortable Americans don't. Right. When you're kind of a small tribe surrounded by Egypt and Syria and these other great powers, Rome, you're sort of, uh, you know, wondering when are we going to get some justice? When are we going to be treated fairly? So I think this whole issue is much more raw in in their minds than it is for us sitting, reading the Psalms. uh, Well, you can also see it in in, uh, a number of places where it talks about walls and things that are strong right. and strongholds and castles. Right. And today we're like, well, you don't want to be in a city because that's where you're going to get mugged. Uh, but back in the day, that was the only safe place was inside right. a place with walls. Otherwise, you know, the invading army would come by and just, you know, destroy everything. He says uh, judges in the Old Testament are more like Jack the Giant Killer than a modern judge yes. in a wig. <laughs> I oh, thought yeah. that was a good right. line. Yeah, champions. Right. He translates Again, it champions. putting it in language that we can understand while also making a deeply profound point. Yeah. The other thing he points out in this chapter that I really like is he turns it around on us and he says, the thing we also have to remember is that, and, and, and the way that this can turn around on us is realizing that there are probably plenty of people that we have wronged. There are people, Uh, there are people that we have done an injustice to, and they probably have claims against us. Almost certainly, he says, there are unsatisfied claims, human claims against each one of us. That idea, and that he goes on to talk about, if we do something to hurt someone else, we are, we're tempting them to hatred and to envy and to bitterness mm. um, and sort of pointing out that the way that we treat other people, it's not just about, you know, what happens to us, but what we might be, we might be forcing right. a temptation on somebody else and forcing them to forgive us over and over and over again for the rest of their life right. for some bad, mean things we might say to somebody. Uh, and so it really turned around. You go, oh, wow, I guess I haven't never really thought about right. it. There probably right. are a list of people who have me on their list of people they, <laughs> they hate or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's uh, interesting to think about it that way. Yeah, at it's one point, doesn't he say, uh, the mystics talk about the dark night of the soul, but what we're seeing here is the dark night of the flesh. Uh, uh, you've yeah. just been so oppressed and mistreated that you've got this really deep bitterness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like how we can redeem what seems to be a difficult passage by giving a new insight about yes, it. Yes, I yeah. know. He's, he's very honest. Uh, a lot of biblical commentators, they just tiptoe around the difficult parts. Right. And yeah. he'll really you know, wrestle with them and try to give you some some helpful insight as to how to deal with that kind of scripture right. passage. And this is totally relevant then to chapter three, which he calls the cursings. And this is where the passage is that Aaron was just making um, oh, allusion to. Yeah, they, sorry. He, at the end of the chapter, he kind of talks about, um, he's sort of setting that up by talking about the uh, the desire for justice versus the desire for revenge and how it's, it's actually kind of a natural thing uh-huh. in our own hearts to want something wrong to happen to the person who wronged us. And, right. You know, so right. when we so see we that, learn, in the, when we see that in the Psalms, we're like, yeah, I get it. I get right. where you're coming we're from. We're learning more about ourselves from yeah. re- reading the Psalms. Um, can I read a passage along those lines? Yeah. There's a passage, which I think he got this concept from uh, all the years he spent with Mrs. Moore. Uh, she was very oh, yeah. willful and, and sometimes, uh, Histrionic and explain who Mrs. Moore is. Mrs. Again. Moore was the uh, woman that became his adoptive mother. She was the mother of Patty Moore, who was killed in World War One, and uh, Lewis became more or less her adoptive son with she and her daughter Maureen. But she apparently was a very difficult person to be mm. around. Uh, he said there were almost daily uh, melodrama with the maids or with the daughter, something of that sort. He's talking about dealing with anger as Christians. As Christians, we must, of course, repent of all the anger, malice, and self-will, which allowed the discussion to become, on our side, a quarrel at all. I love how he stresses through all his books, try to have disagreements without turning them into quarrels. He says that again here. 
But there's also the question on a far lower level. Granted, the quarrel, did you fight fair <laughs> or did we not quite unknowingly falsify the whole issue? Mm, yeah. Did we pretend to be angry about one thing when we knew or could have known that our anger had a different and much less presentable cause? Did we pretend to be hurt in our sensitive and tender feelings? <laughs> Fine natures like ours are so vulnerable. When envy, ungratified vanity, or thwarted self-will was the mm. real trouble. And he mm. says, I don't know how to deal with that in other people, but if you find it in your, in your own motives, you need to ruthlessly root it out. It's a right. beautiful passage. Yeah. So these cursings, we have to look at them as how do we do the same thing, but we don't want to admit it. Yeah, that yeah. is so great. What I love about chapter three is he, he even indicts um, some famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, which in verse five says, thou shalt prepare a table for me against them that trouble me. <laughs> or as someone translates it, Dr. Moffat, thou art my host spreading a feast for me while my enemies have to look on. Yeah, yeah. And it actually shocked me when Lewis says, this may not be so diabolical as the passages I have quoted above. I mean, he even talks about passages in the Psalms as uh-huh. diabolical. Yeah. Now, um, could, could but, we uh, take issue with him on that? Uh-oh. Oh. I always thought it meant, even though I'm surrounded by my enemies, God still provides and gives me yeah. a wonderful bank. Yeah, does maybe. It, does it have to have the element of envy or I uh, think ha, it, ha, 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 ha? It, it, definitely, <laughs> it definitely has a little bit of it because eating at a table with somebody is definitely like a level of hospitality and oh. we're in a close relationship. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's like throwing a dinner party but not inviting your neighbor that you're not. You're, you're not in a good relationship with, you know, uh-huh. and you don't just have the dinner party in your house. You have it in your backyard where they can <laughs> right. watch kind of a thing, you know. Right. It definitely okay. has that vibe to it, I think. Okay. 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 And he calls it the pettiness and vulgarity of it. But once again, you're shocked that he could, how could you say that about the great Psalm 23? But then he moves on to focus, as we've been talking about, our own pettiness. Yeah. He does a this really is, good job with the turn too. Yes, too. The, yeah, oh, does, the yeah. turn. Yeah. Yes. He says in here, he says, uh, if we still believe that all the Holy Scriptures are written for our learning, and if we remember that our Lord's mind and language were clearly steeped in this altar, he then says, what what use can be made of it? Like we've got to, we have to wrestle with this. And I think that's one of the things I enjoy about this book is he's not approaching it simply from the standpoint of, okay, well, let's interpret this specific passage. Let's talk about the passage in Psalm 23, or let's talk about this or that other passage. He zooms out and he says, all right, what do we do with this kind of language, these cursings, so to speak? Um, and then we can kind of apply that as a general principle. So um, I thought it was a really good turn there, especially which he's like, you know, I mean, Jesus read these Psalms, so there's got to be, we can't just right. blow them off. Right, 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 of course. And Jesus, of course, was closer in mindset to the Hebrew worldview. Yeah. So he is understanding, but then almost redeeming many of these Psalms. Yeah. And sometimes he actually changes the language in the Psalms to make them relevant to himself. Yeah. Because he is the ultimate incarnate God. Yeah. One of the examples he, or one of the justifications he gives in here is he, he kind of says that they didn't have the same sort of prohibitions on sharing their resentments that we do today. Mm-hmm. And we can't necessarily you know, be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that out loud. Uh, you know, because he's, he's like, well, today we say all these things in our heart, but we would never say them out loud. Right, and, right. And, you know, because then people right. would think, what a monster David is for saying <laughs> that out loud. Right. But he's like, um, he says, you know, as few but children would express it today. Essentially, children are the only ones that haven't learned. You're not supposed to say these things out loud. But we can't assume that they thought or felt or acted the same way back then. So when we read in the scripture the things we've only thought on our heads, we're like, why would you write that down on paper? In some ways, ancient Israel was was like uh, Poland in the 20th century. One historian said Poland has no boundaries. It only has neighbors. Uh, (laughs) You're you're trapped between Germany and Russia. Yeah. uh, And you're being occupied by both sides. And I imagine the level of resentment that they would express toward the Nazis would be shocking to us. Oh, yeah. We're not in their situation. You know, yeah. we're not being occupied by a, a brutal foreign force. Mm. Well, he says, we live we live in a milder age. These poets lived in a world of savage punishments, of massacre and violence, of blood sacrifice in all countries and human sacrifice in many. And so they just lived in a different world right. than us. Right. Right. right, right. And that's the incarnational principle. We have to think of these, that these are people in the flesh who are reflecting the attitudes of their own times. And it is docetic, a heresy, to not consider their flesh. 
their yeah. enfleshment. And um, nevertheless, he constantly relates it to us. And he talks about the fact when this whole issue of indignation and people, Christians might want, want to quote the Psalms to show that, well, my political party is on the side of God and yours is yeah. not. And how could you be a Christian and vote the way you do? And um, that indignation, C.S. Lewis actually says, this attitude is actually taking the name of God in vain more than just what people say. Oh, taking God's mm. name in vain is if you swear. No, if you align God with your side and judge anybody on the other side as being mm. despicable without giving them voice, that is taking God's name in vain. Yeah. I like this concept that the uh, this, the psalmists or the, the writers of the psalms had what we called an appetite for God, yeah. and, but they did not have a uh, very well-developed sense to the afterlife. Yes. Uh, he says in his own life, he was... That's he was, chapter four. This is good to get well, into. Well, let's talk right? about okay. chapter four then. Yeah. Okay. Um, chapter four. I like how he talks about... Oh, I guess I heard the word five. <laughs> yeah. It's called Death in the Psalms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Hades was just kind of that, whatever happens to you or going down into the pit, but they don't have a very strong sense of the afterlife. And so often as Christians, people think about heaven and hell and the part that you'll be with God is almost an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And he was really glad that they developed this robust attitude toward loving God and his law without saying, oh, this is how I get to heaven or this is how I stay away from hell. He said in his own life that happened. He developed a very strong yearning to know the divine without thinking what that meant in terms of the afterlife. Right, right. And where it just turns Christianity into a, like a pagan religion where you have to do something in order to make sure you get to heaven. Right. Yeah. So it's not about loving God and wanting to know God better. Yeah, Lewis talks, he, the word he liked to use when he talked about that um, idea was mercenary. Yes. Right. He didn't like, yes. He didn't like a, a, a mercenary view of why somebody would want to be saved or be a Christian to be like, well, well, I don't want to burn in hell, so yeah, right. of exactly. course I'm going to do X, Y, Z or whatever. Yeah, and you're right. like, That's paganism. Yeah, yeah. But it is interesting because he does admit at some point like that does seem to be enough for whatever reason, because God is good and, 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 you know, grace and everything that does seem to be enough. Uh, and, but in Lewis's eyes, he kind of wishes that it were more, but he's like, you know, right. God does seem to save people just because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be separated from him forever. Which, right. You know, right. And then, um, this also is incarnational insofar as, as Christians, we read in our, our we read into the Psalms our Christian presuppositions yeah. when that's not the way those people thought. We have to respect how they thought. Yeah, his main point in this chapter is this uh, is essentially saying like the only thing they really thought about when it came to the afterlife is Sheol, and most of that can be translated like the grave. And he, he draws on um, his understanding of Hades and the Greek underworld and these other uh, uh, languages. And his point is being when we read too much into them in terms of their future hope of an eternal life mm -hmm. or these sorts of things, that that's not what they were meaning. That doesn't mean that we can't apply those verses and think about them in those terms, but that's not where they were coming right. from at it. And so sometimes when we interpret verses, we need to be more charitable with our interpretation so it fits their context. So he gives an example of one in uh, Psalm seventeen thirteen that talks about crushing down or casting down the ungodly. And uh, he says, um, he translated, translates it to, yes, crush them, but first let them have their portion in this life means kill them, but first give them a bad time while alive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so he's, he's talking about, you know, a lot of the judgment and the suffering that he's talking about here is not necessarily um, send them to hell for all eternity, which for us would be like, oh my gosh, why would you ever say that? But he's really saying like they need to suffer in this life before they turn into this sort of ghostly thing. It's it's uh, interesting of ways kind of flipping the interpretation of these some of these psalms that we get offended by. Well, he, uh, often I'm interested that concepts in his nonfiction books show up in his fiction. Oh yeah, he talks about in the afterlife. Um, the classical writers often portray dead people as witless. That part of what yeah. you lose when you die is you lose your your lucidity. Yeah. But when I think of someone like uh, Weston in Paralandra, uh, yes. when he becomes the unman, uh -huh. 
I think Lewis is drawing on this classical idea that yeah. you, you, you're kind of this decayed psychic sediment. You're not. Yeah. You're no longer the the uh, person that you were as a living person. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The other one was uh, he talks about the Jewish concept of imeth of uh. truth or rock bottom reality, and that very important uh, key word in Hebrew. And then when we read the last battle, of course, the faithful Calamine who is allowed to join Aslan in the, the new Narnia is named imeth. Right, right. And he gives the example, and part of this incarnational principle is what some theologians call progressive revelation, how slowly, because God honors our flesh. God, unlike many religions that repudiate the flesh, you're supposed to deny the flesh, that God... God sanctified the flesh by taking on flesh, which is an appalling idea, and we forget how appalling it is yeah. because we're so used to it. But it's like slowly the the Hebrews were coming to an understanding and God revealing how much their flesh could take in. And an example Lewis gave that I had never heard about was this ancient Pharaoh who defied oh, right. the paganism yeah. of his day yeah. and started asserting monotheism that there is just one God. And so Lewis suggests, well, maybe when the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt, they picked up on this monotheistic, this is God preparing them. Because as I was read, I was reading through the whole Old Testament this last year, and as I was reading the early, early books, mm-hmm. I was going, these verses make it sound like the Hebrews were polytheistic, yeah. like the pagans that surrounded them. It's yeah. just that their God, Yahweh, was better than other gods. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Lewis admits that, yeah. but it's this slow God moving incarnationally, respecting what people assume and slowly bringing them light until it comes to its fullness, that Christ is the light of salvation. I mean, this is brilliant, and it helps me so much yeah. to appreciate what's happening in the Old Testament. He calls it divine pressure. Uh, uh, that yeah. Somehow there's this spirit-guided process that uh, he talks about the gradual and graded uh, self-revelation of God in the Bible. Yeah. Which is also helpful. Uh, Chris, I think you had a friend who's a theologian who said the Bible is not flat. You can't oh, read it all. That's the way Anabaptists view it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When I was growing up, they would take a verse from Genesis and then one from Romans and then one from Jeremiah right. and put them all together. And the, there wasn't a feeling of seeing the divine pressure of self-revelation as right. the Bible progresses. Right. It's yeah. a Docetic view of Scripture. Yeah, right. yeah. He says in that section where he's talking about the the Egyptian, he's he's saying since in the end we are to come to Baptist and the Eucharist to the stable at Bethlehem, the hill of Calvary, and the emptied rock tomb. Perhaps it is better to begin with circumcision, the Passover, the Ark, and the yes. temple than these sort of high abstract ideas about monotheism and mm-hmm. uh, all right. these different things. And he says, for the entrance is low, we must stoop till we are no taller than children in order to get in. And it's this idea that God has to stoop down to communicate these things right. to us, which interestingly throughout this book, it makes me wonder, he must, his dog must have been sitting next to him when he was yeah. writing this <laughs> Because he mentions it. Yeah. Throughout the book, he constantly gives the analogy or the metaphor of like, well, you know, God is so much higher than us. Then he's like, you know, yeah. my, I don't want to hear from my dog that he liked my books. Yeah. Or my dog probably doesn't understand the first thing about why I'm sitting here writing this book right, or whatever. Right. In fact, and, that's from chapter five. So you've moved us into the next (laughs) chapter, which is about the praise psalms. Yeah. And once again, he, Lewis is making the point, and this is unfortunately um, a very pagan idea that, well, if you want to be, get blessings from God, you better praise him. So it reduces it to this financial exchange. Yeah. Yeah. And Lewis just totally undermines that and says, no, praise is part of our entering into the presence of God. It's not in order to get something from God. I wanted to go that passage about thinking like children. He talks about the little child. They ask about the meaning of Easter. And he said, chocolate eggs and Jesus risen. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Lewis thought that was pretty good for his level of spiritual development. Yeah. Yeah. But the two things didn't get separated in his mind. It yeah. was all right. one experience. Right. Yeah. And if we are 
the little children. Suffer the little children to come unto me, as Christ said. Think of parenting today. You don't explain to your five-year-old how sexual reproduction goes. You know that you wait for a, a readiness so that it can be assimilated and understood. Yeah. And again, that's an incarnational principle. Yeah. You recognize their placement as a flesh and blood human being. Yeah. The thing that I really like from that chapter where he's talking about uh, praising is he eventually arrives at talking the original purpose of sacrifice. And he says, for even in Judaism, the essence of the sacrifice was not really that men gave bulls and goats to God, but that by their so doing, God gave himself to men. In the central act of our own worship, of course, this is far clearer. There is manifestly, even physically, God who gives and we who receive. Mm-hmm. And so he's pointing out, you know, the whole purpose of praising God for who he is or praising God for what he's given us is not that we're necessarily trying to be mercenary, though that was his sort of objection to it when he was before he became a Christian. Um, but it's part and parcel of what it means to be in a relationship with God or with someone else is to give and receive with them, right? It's like if you said, well, every time David does chores or cooks dinner for his wife or something, you know, he, he has an ulterior motive. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, it, that, that's actually just part and parcel of what it means to be in a relationship with someone is to do To things. love them. Yeah, to love right. them. Yeah, it's the difference between, as he talks about in another one of his books, it's the difference between selflessness and love, right? If we, if we uh, elevate it to you know pure selflessness, then it's just this one-sided thing as opposed to love, which is you know the back and forth. Which book is it where he talks about? Um, it sounds mercenary to say we worship God in order to go to heaven, but he says the suitor, the culmination of his pursuit is to become married, and the uh, the military commander, the culmination is victory. Yeah, and so it's not a trade-off. It's not mercenary. It's the culmination of the experience is the reward. It's the relationship. Right. Yeah. The culmination of giving Mm -hmm. gifts to someone Mm -hmm. is a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you do nice things for your spouse because you want to have a healthy marriage, not just purely because you want them to give things to you in return. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. By the way, mm-hmm. Crystal would say the example of me cooking is extremely <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> she said, make sure that's, that's stated hypothetically. <laughs> I was going to make a snarky comment yeah, I, uh, uh, when uh, you I said that. You but I, uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I like about this discussion of praise is why does God want to be praised? It makes him sound kind of egocentric. Yeah. To yeah. say, yeah. you're so good, you're so powerful. And he says that many experiences are not completed until you try to put them in words. Yeah. If you say, oh, what a beautiful sunset, or you share that beautiful moment with someone, it's completed or culminated in a way it wouldn't be if everything right. was just silence. Yeah. yeah, he talks about seeing, yeah, the idea of seeing, a, a, a he says, uh, to not be able to tell anyone how good it is at the turn of a road upon some mountain valley of an unexpected grandeur. They have to keep silent is for him this yeah. almost like a death. It's this sadness. Right. You want to share it with someone else. Yeah. yeah. So the praise is natural rather than yeah. mercenary. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Chester totally. made that point in a number of places. He said, even when I was struggling with my sense of spiritualities, I had this tremendous feeling of gratitude for being alive and all the wonders of, of creation. And I needed to find an object for that gratitude. And yeah. Part of what brought him to faith was to be able to have a proper expression of that emotion. Yeah, mm-hmm. he says, uh, to appreciate, that is to love and delight in the worthiest object of all, and simultaneously at every moment to give this delight perfect expression is for that soul to be in supreme beatitude. Right. And so, you know, the idea is like this, it's kind of what we were made for, and it's who God is. And, and in giving and receiving thanks and praise, um, we're actually becoming, you know, that's this beatitude. It's this perfect state of existence for us. Right. Okay, that leads us into the next chapter, chapter six, which continues the idea of praise, but it narrows the focus to the way the psalmist prays the law. And yeah. of course, for us as Christians, when both Jesus and then the apostles were just repudiated the legalism that they felt that the Hebrews had fallen into, we don't quite understand, well, how can you praise the law? So this is another troublesome thing that Lewis wants to deal with. And what I really like in this chapter where the law is sweeter than honey 
he reminds us that the word true, and this will come up later as well, we tend to, because of our situatedness, our enfleshment in a very highly scientific era where many people say, well, the only thing that can be true is something that can be empirically verified by science. And he was saying we have to think of true in terms of faithful or sound, as when you say, yeah, the, the joints of that house frame are true. Yeah. And that's still mm-hmm. um, a statement that you'll hear people make, especially mm-hmm. in construction. Yeah, yeah. And will it hold up? And so if we think of the law and get away from, oh, that's so legalistic, and think of it as this is sound advice, because God who created the universe knows the consequences that occur when you commit adultery, when you murder, yeah. when you tell lies, yeah. when you covet. Yeah. And it's not like he's this arbitrary, and Lewis actually uses this phrase, arbitrary tyrant. Mm-hmm. God wasn't an arbitrary tyrant and said, what am I going to make humans have to do? Yeah, exactly. No. Up is down, left is right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, God knows what is best for us. God loves us. And so the law is sweeter than honey because it shows us what is sound, what is well built, what will preserve us from horrible consequences. Yeah, he also gives an example of them being surrounded by the Assyrians or he says, um, you know, sacred prostitution uh, the babies thrown into the fire for the Moloch. You can yeah. imagine people living in a culture like that would look and look at God's judgments and his laws and, and say, you know, th- that it has this extraordinary radiance, that it's sweeter than honey. Um, it got me thinking the other day, I was reading a story about uh, in Haiti, basically all of their elected officials have left and they're just mm. being totally ruled by gangs. And it's just, mm. there's no regard for human life. There's no civil or government authority that you can appeal to for justice or protection. I mean, it's, 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 their country is really descended into chaos. Mm-hmm. We really need to pray for Haiti. Okay. But it just made me think in the U S there's been this big push against government, this and government overreach and, you know, the government telling us what to do and rules and regulations and, you know, sort of want to push back against that. But then you see the opposite of it, right? You see the chaos where there is no government, mm. there is no judge, there are no laws, there is no right or wrong. And you think to yourself, in that culture, those people are probably longing for a a strong government, uh, a police officer, somebody that, you know what I mean? Like the things that we take for granted, they come into contrast when you you live in a world where they don't have them. He even gives example. They want law and order. Ding, ding. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Bong, bong. Yeah. (laughs) He gives example of, you know, they understand what that's like because they just went through this period where, you know, the Nazis were coming in and bombing them every day. And, you know, to understand what it's like to be oppressed by somebody. Mm. um, Right. Right. Puts the law and judge right judgment into better context. Mm. The next chapter, chapter seven, is called Connivance. And once again, he is showing how the Psalms can expose our own flaws by making us think of people who, and in our culture, this is very true still today, where if someone is a celebrity, Even if they lead a vile and mischievous life, as Lewis puts it, and Mm -hmm. you could use much more degrading terms than that for many celebrities, politicians today who we discover lie and cheat and will say anything to get votes. And um, so the trouble is, even though they are despicable human beings, people will still go out of their way to meet them. And in our culture, culture, a lot of celebrity is just based on someone who has a lot of money. Yeah. You know, and hence why Hollywood stars or even people who weren't stars are considered um, celebrities if they've made a lot of money. And so, oh, I could possibly meet this person. Mm. When, and, you know, that that happens to all of us. Yeah. That he kind of sets it up at the beginning where he, he, he mentions a, a bunch of different psalms that talk about hating those who hate God, hating the idolaters and things like that, as opposed to being someone who, uh, he says, is a friend to a thief. 
And so he's kind of setting up this idea because in the New Testament, uh, we're told to love our enemies and do good things to them. And then Jesus hangs out with the sinners and the publicans. And so there's this tension between like the psalmist and and the poets are like, you know, well, I, I hate those who hate you uh, versus Jesus hanging out with sinners. And so you kind of right. go, well, which one is it? Uh, am I supposed to be nice to people who hate God or am I supposed to hate them? I like the distinction he sets up, which is essentially like there are people who are in power and who know better and these kinds of situations. That's where I give the example, the celebrity or the um, government official or something like that versus the downtrodden poor person right. who has no influence right. in society, who probably has never been given very many chances. And Jesus is showing compassion to those people, to the prostitute who's been forced into this or the woman caught in adultery. Right. But he's not showing compassion to the Pharisees and the people who are in power. Yeah, the self-righteous. The self-righteous. And so uh, he, I thought he did a good job of sort of setting up like how we're supposed to read those kinds of uh Saw those passages in the Psalms about hating people who hate those and stuff right, like that. Right, right. Mm. Yeah, and he ends the whole chapter talking about the worst sins are sins of the tongue. He says the psalmists mention hardly any kind of evil more than this one. And by that, he means <sighs> yeah. flatterers, yeah. you know. And once again, it's that idea of what you get in exchange. I flatter this person so I can get something out of them. Yeah. Um, which is no different than people thinking, well, I got to worship God if in order to go to heaven. Go along and, to get along. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or um, lying lips and um, talk that sounds smooth as oil and just, you know, saying things that you know your audiences want to hear yeah. in order to get what you want. Yeah. So it just changes up things. And <clears throat> that's why throughout um, medieval drama, which was written by Christian priests, the preeminent sin when they displayed the sins on stage was pride. Oh, uh, yeah. Wanting all the attention for yourself rather than humility. Yeah. Well, there are probably too many chapters in the book for us to keep on going on like this, but uh -huh. I really wanted to get y'all's opinion about the chapter on Scripture. So he literally just has a chapter called Scripture, uh, and he talks about his view of how to read Scripture and how it differs from what he calls a fundamentalist view. And I thought that was a very interesting chapter and worth uh, definitely worth discussing because that is something that he... He does a couple times towards the end of his life. He talks about how he reads scripture and how he interprets it. And yeah, it's interesting because I think it definitely would differ potentially from some of the uh, evangelicals in the United States who are really big fans of Lewis. Uh, so to me, it's always an interesting topic to discuss. What are your thoughts on uh, that? Well, he's in an interesting middle place because some people consider him a fundamentalist because he allows for the possibility yeah. of miracles. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, but then he mentions that... Uh, he says, but I do not hold any more than St. Jerome did when he said that Moses described creation after the manner of a popular poet, as we should say, mythically. So he is allowing, uh, and he mentions Calvin as well, not reading scripture as strictly factual or historical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Clyde Kilby, the professor at Wheaton College who um, founded the, the Wade Center, started out as the C.S. Lewis collection. He wrote to Lewis about his view of scripture. And Lewis wrote back and pointed out that we don't believe a parable the same way believe an incident. If, if Jesus says uh, there was a son who took his father's inheritance and went off, yeah, yeah. we understand that to be a story. Yeah. Um, he started out this letter to Clyde Kilby by saying, if what I say in this letter bothers anyone, please tear it up and throw it in the trash. <laughs> oh. uh, he wanted a sense of harmony in the Christian right. community yeah. more than he wanted to put forth his own ideas. But he did say, and even Paul says, uh, this is not the Lord, but this is my opinion. Yeah. Right. So Lewis said you can't read the Bible monolithically. You have to take into account uh, genre, uh, rhetorical devices, such as telling a parable. Right. I think part of the reason I've always loved reading Lewis is I had this checklist of unanswered questions. The problem of the noble heathen, the problem of God predestining people to hell. And one by one, Lewis just has this checklist where he's willing to tackle those questions. Yes. And to me, it's much more comforting to think of the Bible as this spirit-guided process of people understanding the light of Christ more and more. 
he says at one place the the light gets brighter, but it never actually changes in its essence. Mm. Uh, and yes. he, he also says that um, knowing that God came to earth and died for our sins gives a kind of tragic element to Christian theology that you don't find in the Old Testament. Yeah, mm. And so rather than just saying progressive revelation, he actually shows you how that might work. Yes. He shows yeah. you how this he shows rather than tells. illumination. Yes. Well, I, I uh, it's what's interesting to me is he, he, he goes out of his way to say, he, after talking about all that stuff, he says, the human qualities of the raw material show through naivety, error, contradiction, even as in the cursing in the Psalms, wickedness are not removed. And then he goes on to compare it to, it's not like a multiplication table. It's not yeah. like God gave us this document that's totally absent emotion and is just this sort of scientific treatise about yes. everything, but there's a rawness to it. Um, and it's incarnational. Yeah, it's incarnational. But what he goes on to say is like, you know, if we assume that we know what's best for us and we think that God should have given that to us and then we turn the Bible into that thing and we right. turn it into something that it's not, we're not doing it justice. And perhaps God knows better than us. And what he did give us is what's best for us. But we don't need to gloss over all the messiness and turn it into a multiplication table. And I, I know I like that perspective that says like, we don't need to try and turn the Bible into something that it's not. Right. We need to recognize for it for what it is and for what God intended mm -hmm. it for. And, and it should, you know, it should be valued and it should be praised, but we don't need to go out of our way to uh, excuse all the messiness or wipe it away or to right. justify it and say, it's right. okay to bash babies heads against the wall or something like that. You know? I also like in this chapter, he's, he, he gives the example of Paul and he's like, look, if it was up to me and I was going to give somebody the job of systematizing the theology <laughs> based on everything that happened in the gospels, I probably wouldn't have picked Paul because he's just like rhetorical over the and place, yeah. sophistry and there's right. like personal anecdotes and it's just so hectic and, you know, you just have to spend your entire life trying to disentangle everything that he's talking about. And he's like, but his his point is like, Perhaps God knew better what we needed than what we think we need. And we don't, you know, like you said, do we don't need to turn it into something that it's not in order to meet right. the assumptions of our day, which is it's scientific or what Paul is doing here is making this modern kind of argument where he's laying everything out in this, you know, perfectly logical way. And that's how we have to read it. You know, mm -hmm. we just need to let it be what it is and let God speak through it in the way that he intended, which is mm -hmm. what's best for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Lewis in Problem of Pain gives an interesting uh, take on progressive revelation. He says that all the, in classical societies, they had numinous experiences. They had feelings of mm. something divine and huge and, uh, full of power, but they didn't necessarily associate it with, with uh, ethics or goodness. So you had ethical systems and you had these numinous experiences. And he says, the Jews were the first ones who put them together and said, this powerful God is also a, a righteous God. And he wants us to be righteous. Uh, the other books where it says, uh, it's not about sacrifices. It's about justice and mercy. And then he says, the final uh, revelation came that the, righteous God and the powerful God is also a sacrificing God. He's willing mm. to put us right with him through his own efforts. So it's, it's his own kind of interesting way of constructing progressive revelation as mm. he looks at history. Yeah. Mm. The, the last chapter, I'll just mention that and then um, we can wrap up. Uh, he, he talks about second meanings. Uh, All right. This passage from the Psalms is this a prophecy. Did this person foresee this thing oh, right. or Jesus's birth or something like that? Or was it an, an accident? Like he was the example of a, a Roman bath attendant and somebody complains about the temperature and he goes, oh yeah, it's, it's, you know, just give it some time. It'll get hotter. And then the bath burns to the ground mm -hmm. or something. And they're like, oh, was he a ter secretly a terrorist? And right. he, right. He, you know, so he gives all these examples of how it might work out. And the one that he seems to prefer is the one where the wise man thinks, oh, well, snow stays on the mountains longer because it's colder up there. Perhaps that there's a mountain that's so tall that the snow stays on it year round. Were he to then be shown the Alps, he wouldn't go, oh, I never would have known that. He would have go, yeah, I would have been able to predict that because mm. of my wisdom. Right. I see that there's a pattern to things. And so he seems to prefer that one. He gives a couple examples even of applying some Psalms to Jesus's birth and things like that. And mm. I thought he did a good job in there of sort of setting up how 
maybe the psalmist didn't have this revelation of this thing that was mm-hmm. going to happen to the life right. of Christ. Right. But still, through the influence of the Holy Spirit and inspiration, mm-hmm. he was able to say, you know, perhaps this is what it would be like. He also gives the example of um, uh, Plato and the Republic and the innocent man right. who suffers yeah, and the Jesus. Man. Yeah. yeah, once again, those, and Virgil, who seemed to predict the coming of Jesus. Yeah. But he said it's not really... Uh, magical prophecy right it's more the nature of reality if you think about something long enough mm-hmm. you're going to start coming up with these principles i had a professor a theology professor who said suppose you're walking in a very deep fog and you hear some crackling of branches and you go there's something out there as you get closer you can make out a human form and you say oh it's it's a human and then as you get closer yet you realize it's a female and then finally an older female he said uh never at any stage were you wrong uh-huh. But you just got right. more and more insight as to what you were encountering uh, there yeah, in the fog. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And I think Lewis feels that way about Scripture, that they're not really wrong about God's nature. They're just learning more right. and more about his nature. Right. It's like Jesus. It's fully human and fully divine simultaneously. Yeah, right. definitely. Well, uh, takeaways, final thoughts on uh, this book. Crystal, you talked about uh, the role that it played uh, with you with reading the Psalms. What about you, David? Well, since we're talking about final things, I'd like to read the last passage in the book. Oh, okay. Yeah. He says, we are so little reconciled to time that we're even astonished at it. How he's grown, we exclaim, how time flies, as though the universal form of our experience were again and again a novelty. (laughs) It is as strange as if a fish were repeatedly surprised at the wetness of water. (laughs) And that would be strange indeed, unless, of course, the fish were destined to become one day a land animal. Mm-hmm. Interesting analogy to wrap up the whole book. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. He, he ends it the way he loves to end the books, which is thinking about the new heaven and the new earth. Right, mm-hmm. right. he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. We will be back the last Friday of February, and we hope you will join us again then. The Wade Center podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to the Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.